Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a few seconds here. We're just going to allow more people to enter the room here. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Molly McGurr. I am the Events and Programs Manager for Traverse Connect. And we are so excited to be able to host this forum for you today um, in relations to childcare. And we definitely wanna make sure that everyone here has a chance to ask any and all questions that you may have. This is your opportunity to get those questions out here with our experts today. Um, comments, questions, please make sure you're asking them. We do have a Q&A button located in the bottom of your screen where you can go ahead and ask questions, or we have a chat box as well. And if you don't feel comfortable asking a question uh, with everyone else in the chat box, you can select on my name, Molly McGurr, and I will be the only person to see that question. I don't say anyone's names. I don't read your names when I'm asking the question, only the content um, that you're asking. I also just want to note that this will be recorded and up live on the Traverse Connect YouTube page and on the Traverse Connect website within 24 hours. So on that note, I would now like to turn it over to Brenda McClellan. Brenda, thanks for being here with us today. Thank you, Molly. Uh, I'm Brenda McClellan, Director of Investor Engagement at Traverse Connect. And um, welcome, everyone. We do appreciate you joining the discussion this morning. I have the pleasure of introducing our three panelists, and uh, I would love for you all to give a warm welcome to Lisa brewer -Wall Raven. Uh, Lisa is the Director of Child Development and Care Office of Great Start. We also have with us today Mark C. Jansen, uh, Director of Child Care Licensing Division, and uh, Michelle Richard, Deputy to the Senior Advisor to the Governor of Michigan Prosperity. Michelle, let's begin with you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Of course, thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Molly. Um, I know I can speak on behalf of Mark and Lisa that we're delighted to be with you today. Uh, our shared objective is to make sure that children and families have safe spaces to go um, and that our childcare providers remain strong. We are extremely grateful to all of you on the line Line, particularly to our healthcare providers themselves, who we really see as first responders during this crisis. You have allowed essential workers to stay working, and that's kept our community stronger and safer, and we are extremely, extremely grateful to you um, as we jump into this work. I, I wanted to start by sharing just a couple of slides to give you a sense of how Mark, Lisa, and I, and, and the entire team across the state of Michigan are really working to organize, um, are really working to organize our, our shared work. We um, here at the state have started by ensuring that we are working across agency. I know our child care work here in Michigan exists in a few different agencies. And Mark, Lisa, and I meet every single day to make sure that we're sharing information about what's happening in the field and that our response is as coordinated as possible. In all of this work, we've really been focused on two high-level goals when it comes to child care. The first has been helping families find quality, affordable care. We know that that is always a challenge in this state, even at the best of times. During the COVID-19 crisis, we know finding quality affordable care has been more of a challenge than ever. Um, when our economy has been closed during the stay home, stay safe order, that goal has really been focused on our essential workers and our critical infrastructure workers. Now, as the economy is starting to slowly reopen, workers who are eligible to resume work are also eligible to access formal childcare again. And so we've been really focused on how do we help make those connections? How do we make sure that families are served well and that children are safe? The second goal we've been focused on has been really um, aimed at our providers. We know that care isn't affordable if it's not accessible. 
So we've been saying, what can we do to support childcare providers in our state to make sure that each and every person who was providing care before the crisis has a pathway to keep their business open and financially sustainable throughout and after this crisis? We need you more than ever, and we want to make sure that you have the tools to stay, um, to stay financially solvent, but also to thrive. There have really been five strategies that we've been focused on and that I think will be the heart of what we're talking about um, today. The first, and it's always the foundation of the work we do in childcare, but I think has been a much stronger focus than normal, is health and safety. We need to ensure that the children that are in our care and the workers who are providing that care are safe. Mark's going to talk a bit more in, um, in a few minutes about all of the work we're doing across the state to issue health and safety guidelines that help you make decisions that are um, in the best interest of the children, families, and staff members that you're supporting and serving. The second thing we've been focused on, we've been affectionately calling matchmaking. We know that during this time, there is often a mismatch between availability of childcare and family needs. We've been calling it supply and demand. We know that as more industries return to work, that as more childcare providers reopen or start to serve more children, that our goal is ultimately that families are able to return to their pre-COVID-19 care environment. But in the event that they're not able to do that for a whole series of reasons, we're trying to find strategies to help them connect with open providers, connect with providers that can meet their needs from affordability and hours. And so we've been looking at tools like Help Me Grow, which we can talk a little bit more about later as well, that helps make that connection. The next space we've been really focused on is our workforce. And I intentionally chose this superhero icon here because again, you have been a, such a critical part of our COVID-19 response and we know you have a really challenging job right now. We have been looking at how we can keep workers safe. Um, that ranges from some of the protections that are offered to all workers in Michigan, but also being able to think through what are the health and safety guidelines for people who serve small children who struggle to socially distance? How can we keep you as safe as possible? Um, we're also looking at strategies to be able to provide some technical assistance that is more targeted and responsive to COVID-19. The good news is that child care providers in Michigan have so many tools to be able to respond effectively to COVID. Um, you are probably the best position of any industry, um, maybe except healthcare, to respond to managing infectious disease. You do it every winter. Um, and so we're trying to say, what are the tools in your toolbox now? How do we need to rethink those tools in light of COVID and give you the support um, and protection that you need to be successful? We also know that all of this is expensive. Care is always an expensive proposition and it's more expensive as we start looking at changes in the number of children you're serving, changes in the types of supplies that you need. So Lisa is going to talk a bit about what are the financial resources that we're able to provide as a state to support you. Um, we think that there's quite a few. So we're hopeful that those will position you um, to serve the children and the families that, that you serve but also that we're able to, you know, I admit modestly, make care more affordable for families. All families are stretched right now. Um, what can we do as an industry? What can we do as a state to make it just a little bit easier for families to get the care that they need? The, the last area of focus is most of our conversation so far has been around licensed child care, which I think predominantly people think of serving children from, from birth ish to age five ish, um, sometimes more lower elementary kids. But we have also as a state been really thinking about how can we support families who have school age children, um, maybe children six to 12, who need safe spaces when their, their parents and, and caregivers start to return to work. I think so many of the things we're learning about our licensed child care space apply to summer programming as well, but we're also looking at some of the unique elements um, that would allow us to keep children safe, you know, on a soccer field or um, in a tent. What are our options to keep children safe and what options do we believe are safe for this summer as well? So we're happy to take questions 
um, about that as well. Mark, do you want to tell people a little bit more about the health and safety work that we're doing as well? Um, yeah, let me introduce myself. Um, Mark Jansen, Child Care Licensing Director. Um, I actually work in LARA, which is an exciting department uh, licensing and regulatory affairs. Um, we've been now calling um, every day with Michelle and Lisa to coordinate um, really what we're doing in the state of Michigan for child care. So you know maybe me as a child care consultant, if you're a licensed provider, um, and um, that's our job. We have about 8,600 providers before COVID. Uh, we had a capacity of about 355,000 children in our licensed facilities. I think that's changing. Um, our goal has been how do we help providers in this process and parents. Um, working with Michelle and Lisa, um, we began a few weeks ago talking about how do we reopen um, licensed child care um, providers. And so we have been working on a document. Um, it has been passed through about every department in the state of Michigan. We've had the uh, Michigan Pediatrics Association. We've had University of Michigan Medical top-notch um, advisors. We've had uh, providers looking at this. And so within the next few days, we expect a document to be sent out um, from the governor's office and also sponsored by us in Lara. And it's gonna cover how do you reopen if you are a provider? And it's gonna cover everything from uh, preparing your physical space, uh, monitoring the symptoms of COVID-19, uh, setting the guidelines for returning to care and work. How do you practice social distancing? Uh, reinforcing the best practices to promote hygiene? How do we use appropriate safety and equipment? Um, how do we partner and communicate with families? And how do we partner and communicate with staff members? This is about a 12 page document. It's intended to be uh, very useful for you as providers, but we would call it a very living document. Um, we intended our very best to take CDC and DHHS, um, very much the experts in Michigan and even the nation, um, trying to do our very best to help you as providers and for parents to understand as well. And our goal is to help you be successful when you become to the point where you want to reopen. And so our intent is this will go out, um, but it will be very much alive and uh, probably on a daily basis, we'll be looking at better ideas, better answers from folks, um, and we will then be updating the link. So it'll go out on uh, licensing listserv, and it will also be posted on, I think the COVID website and then Lara's website. So it should be accessible for anybody who has um, technological abilities. We're thinking through what happens when people don't have technology, um, that's a bit of a challenge for us because the moment we would print something would be the moment it would be outdated. And so we, we're trying to work our way through that idea for the Northern uh, caregivers. So um, that's kind of what we're trying to do. I also wanna tell you that um, my licensing consultants have been calling providers on a weekly basis. We understand right now that 87 facilities are open in what I call the Northwest region. 134 facilities are closed. Um, we understand this is only a snapshot and a small portion of this group. Um, and then my, my consultants are also calling providers to do this um, uh, wellness check, but find out how they're doing. Are they gonna reopen? And then also um, we are asking them to help um, clean up what's called their child care background check system where uh, staff who've had a background check with the FBI, maybe that information isn't correctly connected. So we're helping them avoid um, violations in the future. So again, we're trying to do everything we can to help providers as we are in a lull of caring for children, but we can help them with their administrative work. So those are just some of the things licensing is doing. Um, and uh, I'll pass it on to, um, I think, Lisa? Yeah. 
I interrupt really quick before you jump in, Lisa? Just one clear, one thing I want to emphasize is Mark said, this is a living document. It's a dozen pages. That is not 12 pages of new rules and regulations that you must follow. It's guidance that helps you operate as effectively and safely as you can during this time. So if you've been following the CDC recommendations or you've read content from the American Academy of Pediatrics, you will see the same content appearing here. Um, we are being as aligned with those national guidelines as we possibly can. We tried to aggregate all of those resources so you didn't have to look for them. We're looking for them on your behalf to try to make um, your life just a little bit easier. We know you have a lot on your plate. Um, but think technical assistance and support and not a new list of, of compliance items that you need to consider. Thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Brewer Walraven. I'm the Director of the Child Development and Care Program at the Michigan Department of Education in the Office of Great Start. I actually oversee the child care development block grant dollars that come to the state of Michigan to support low income families with children birth through 12, uh, find high quality child care access, as well as working to improve uh, and provide supports to those in the field for those quality programs. And we have lots of partners that we work with to make that happen. Um, I get to share a little bit about the financial pieces that Michelle mentioned earlier that we've been trying to put in place to provide support to families who need access to childcare, as well as for providers who are either currently providing care or gearing up to provide care again. Um, and some of those changes have been specific to families who participate in the child care subsidy program. So we've been making some provisions within those supports to extend um, or provide some flexibility with those funds. So for example, for school age children, we increased all of their authorizations to 90 hours over a two week period, specifically when uh, schools were closed and we moved into the stay home, stay safe. Some of those children needed more care than they would have traditionally during this time period in the school year. So we wanted to make sure those children had an opportunity to go to programs if that was something that their family needed. We also extended redetermination deadlines for child care subsidy families who had uh, their cases coming up for reevaluation um, now through June. So those have been extended so that child care subsidy cases should not be closing uh, and those families should not have an interruption in those supports uh, in getting care for their children. We also have been allowing providers who care for children who receive the subsidy to bill based on enrollment versus attendance um, so that they're not exhausting all of the absence hours that we typically have available for them uh, as a way to help uh, with costs. We also were able to move forward with child care provider rate increases uh, the legislature had appropriated the department funding to do rate increases effective January 1 of this year. Uh, we had some delays in regards to technology in terms of rolling that out, uh, but we're able to get that built in for the end of April. And we made it um, retroactive back to that January 1 date to ensure that providers and families were able to receive that benefit during the time period that was intended. So providers are receiving supplemental payments back to that January 1 date uh, for that rate increase and without them having to go back in and, and rebuild or do anything. The other thing that was great about the rate changes was being able to now have three age bands 
So we have an infant toddler age band, a preschool and a school age. So uh, a shift that providers had been asking for for a while uh, that we were finally able to implement. Uh, another great opportunity we've had to meet the two goals that Michelle referenced at the beginning uh, was being uh, able to roll out a $130 million grant opportunity. Um, it's non-competitive. It is all federal funding, the bulk of that funding coming from the CARES Act, uh, which is um, an, a federal uh, act uh, providing additional money to states for uh, responding to the pandemic. Uh, so this grant opportunity, the goal is all 100% of eligible providers apply and get this funding. And when we say 100%, we mean providers who are currently open and serving families and providers who are currently closed, uh, but are, um, again, thinking about and planning for reopening as more and more individuals come back into the workforce. So this is for licensed providers, for tribal child care providers, for provisionally licensed disaster relief child care centers, which were created under executive order, and for licensed exempt providers in the months of April, May, and June. So they're able to get these grants for three months. Uh, they do apply for each month. And the amount of the award that they are eligible for depends on the type of provider they are, how many staff they have, uh, how many children they're serving, and what their quality rating is. Um, lots of positive response to this opportunity. Uh, lots of applications as of Monday morning. We had 4,980 applications. They're still coming in. So that number is already out of date uh, this morning. Um, but again, high interest and lots of applications coming in for us to process. And we want Northwest Michigan to be the first region with 100% participation. <laughs> Where do they go to learn more about that program, Lisa? So you would go to our um, Department of Education website um, to the Child Development and Care webpage. So www.michigan.gov uh, slash child care. And those I think are the highlights of what we've been able to do financially other than connecting providers to information about other opportunities like the payroll protection program or trying to uh, connect them with the unemployment insurance agency for questions that they, they may have. Um, we're not the experts in either one of those programs, so we try and connect them with where they can get that information. Do you have questions from folks on the line? Yes, I do. Yep. So we did get a few in here. The first one that I'm going to start with is what is the timeline within which we will know if we are able to operate our summer program, which is scheduled to begin June 15th? Yeah, so we're, we're still working on the recommendations for summer programming. I do think that when we release our child care guidance, we've been really working with partners in summer programming to make sure that it's what I call philosophically consistent. So here in Michigan, regardless of where you are caring for a child, there are things we believe must be in place to keep those children safe. Um, all of the elements that Mark mentioned apply both in a child care setting and in a summer camp or summer programming setting as well. Uh, certainly recognize that what's necessary for a 12-month-old and what's necessary for a 12-year-old is different. If you're on a soccer field or a classroom, those things are different as well. We continue to believe that there are safe ways for those summer programs to operate and we're finding um, the path forward for them. I have not gotten a signal yet that we will be shuttering all summer programming. Um, and I would certainly encourage those of you who offer summer programming 
to delay the decision to cancel as long as you can. I, I recognize what a challenge that is. Um, we're still learning a lot about what it takes to operate those programs safely, which is our, our first and uh, foremost priority. And Michelle, um, the DRCCs, the, the Disaster Relief Child Care Centers, um, we have had interest from camps to look at that option, which the governor put out in one of her exec orders. So I, I think we'll keep working with the governor's office on that DRCC, really that, that um, idea and whether something could be done in the camp arena using the DRCC, but we don't have an answer yet on that one. Perfect, good to know. Um, the next question that came in said, the local health department said that an exposure of someone living, living with a positive could last 30 to 45 days. This will be impossible for an employer losing an employee and a family who must pay for care once a center needs to make the transition to charging for services. Will there be more guidance on this so I can make a good decision about reopening? Yes, I mean, Mark, do you want to take that or? Um, I, I would say we're going to be working very closely with the local health departments and DHHS and the CDC. Um, that, that is something I have not heard, um, not that length of time. Um, we've had calls with uh, pediatric experts and some other folks. Um, I think we'd want to run that through, at least for me anyway, that group of folks to get the best guidance that we can. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a... Uh, healthcare expert by any means. So we really do rely on those kinds of folks. So I'm sorry, I, I don't really have the best answer for you, but we'll continue to try to find the best guidance that we can for you. Well, and we do include in the, in the health and safety guidance that Mark's team is getting ready to publish, we do discuss how you should monitor symptoms and then how you should respond when someone in your care um, either a child or a staff member or a family member of either of those individuals, how you should respond. Um, the length of time you've suggested is longer than, than the recommendation from many other organizations right now. But like Mark said, we really know that there are differences between communities and using the guidance we'll be issuing along with input from your local health department is certainly the way to, to make those decisions on a business level. The next question is, um, should we be using the 10 per classroom recommendation in a regularly licensed facility? Yeah, so group size has certainly been a question that, we, that we've gotten a lot. Um, there aren't national guidelines right now on, on group size and how to manage that. Um, we have reached out, like Mark said, to a number of medical professionals and, and asked for their opinion and we're reviewing a recommendation internal to the governor's office right now that weighs, that maximizes health and safety for children and, and for staff, um, but also recognizes the economic challenges that come with reducing group size significantly. So we've been working to understand what's the transmission risk for 10 children versus 20 versus 100 in a summer camp type environment. Um, we're still learning there. Um, currently, we understand that there, there is no change in the licensing regulations that we've issued in the state of Michigan. I know a few other states have amended their group size requirements. We have not. Um, at this time, we certainly recommend that you do everything you can to limit group size um, so that you can have fewer children. This kind of less is best mentality seems to be clear from our medical professionals that where you can um, smaller group sizes are better than larger ones, um, but we will be issuing in that document that Mark referenced a recommendation for all of you on that. And do you guys have a timeline for when they will be able to see the document that Mark is referencing? Yeah, I wish that I could tell you a specific day, um, and, but I can't. We're, we're rushing for late this week, early next. Um, we can make sure to coordinate with Brenda and, and Molly to make sure that everyone on this call um, or that the Travers Connect community has access to that as soon as it's live. And then another follow-up question to that living document um, said, could you please clarify if the contents will be recommendations or licensing requirements? Our resource center has required questions from providers regarding whether licensing will be enforced 
enforcing any new expectations at the time of reopening? Um, I'll take that one. It will be a guideline document. So we're looking at the best practices um, and we're using the executive orders as our guidance. Um, but the, the rules and the law will stay the same as the, they have been. Uh, but these are going to be guidelines that we um, will be sharing with the child care community. I, I will I will add, um, child care providers are businesses as well. They're employers. And employers do have an obligation under executive order to have a COVID-19 preparedness and response plan if they are open and operating. And so the document is intended to help you meet that obligation, but you are required to have a plan to cover the items that are included. So what you need to do is, is mandated by executive order, but how you implement that in your particular business or your site, we recognize that that will vary depending on a whole lot of factors. And so we're trying to give you good tools to make those decisions. And you may have already addressed this, but are you able to share any specific health, health guidance that is in that document or is it best just to wait for when it comes out? Um, I, I would say um, we're very, very close to sharing it with the world. Um, it is kind of, got, kind of going through some of the higher level um, reviewing, but uh, I would say that the document's been built for three weeks and it's in very nice condition, I guess I would say. And so I think now it's going through that approval process, which um, might take um, a, either a, a fairly short amount of time or like uh, Michelle said, it could be late this week, early next week. But um, I think we'd be better off just letting you have the document. And then if you have issues, questions, uh, we will continue to work with who, whoever brings in new information that we would uh, change that living document as needed. Yeah, we know, we know the governor has spoken a number of times about the My Safe Start plan, and she's talked about what it takes for any employer to operate safely um, as we start to, to slowly um, reopen our economy. So all of the elements that, that we know are essential for any employer are, are even more essential for child care providers. So things like monitoring symptoms, um, responding when you have evidence that someone in your care has, um, it has been exposed or, or personally has a case of COVID-19. Finding ways to socially distance. That looks different in a manufacturing facility than it does in your classrooms and in your homes. We certainly recognize that. And so we tried to gather the best ideas and thoughts of how might you do that. For example, how might you use physical barriers like a bookcase to divide space? Um, how might you limit the number of providers that care for children? We know at the end of the day, many providers are condensing classrooms and they're moving staff around to make sure that you can send people home um, and that you can serve families economically and efficiently. Some of those things might be more challenging to implement at, at this time. Because you're trying to maintain social distancing and consistency of providers. Uh, again, our intent has been to be as consistent with the existing guidelines as possible. So I'm not anticipating, if you've been watching what to do and you've been trying to make your own plan, we hope there's some good tips for you, but we don't anticipate that there are surprises. We've asked a number of child care providers and a number of child care technical assistance experts to take a look at it and say, what would shock you? What would surprise you? What would be difficult to implement? We're really trying to be as provider family friendly as possible while also maximizing health and safety for our families. Perfect. Um, the next question is, I believe to keep families safe, I will need to test employees for both asymptomatic COVID-19 as well as antigen. I know how to do COVID-19 testing, but how do I do the antigen? I need a baseline before we all go back. Yeah, I think certainly the gold standard here would be to test widely before we start opening. Unfortunately, availability of testing just doesn't allow for that right now. Um, so our recommendation is using temperature and symptom checks. So for children, a temperature of over 100.4, well, and for adults, but a temperature of over 100.4 is a red flag and it's a symptom that we would recommend you exclude children from care for, which we know nearly all of you are doing already, but also looking for other symptoms like coughing, vomiting, diarrhea, some of these things that we're seeing in children, flushed faces, 
we have a whole list of things where the COVID symptoms, um, they look a little different for young kids. Um, we do know that, again, child care providers are a frontline staff. So there are, there is a mechanism for providers and frontline staff to be tested, um, even if they're asymptomatic or have mild testing. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services has put out guidance about how to find test sites in your community. Unfortunately, it, that's not a daily testing protocol at this point. Um, we're still working on that as a state and hope to be making progress on it soon. And in that document will be uh, like links for those, how do I find the site to go get tested? So those are the kinds of resources that you will find in that document. Oh, wonderful, good. Um, next question is, a strong bleach and water mix is recommended for disinfecting isolation, other areas. This mix can only be used when children aren't in the building. How will this be managed once we reopen? Uh, this is Mark. We uh, have talked to local health departments about um, kind of that mix of bleach and water. Um, I believe that's in the document as well. If it's not, um, I will try to get that out um, to you as well. But there is, uh, we did check in with the health department on that particular one. Will ratios be expanded to help more school aged children if we do not take infants? On the licensing side, ratios will stay the same as what the uh, current ratios are. Unless something is included on the group size, but that uh, the ratios would still apply. Um, we've had that discussion as well. Um, so this is kind of along the same lines. When looking at group sizes, will caregivers' requirements be taken into consideration? For example, preschool lead requirements. Yeah, that's a great question. We have certainly been looking at as we implement, um, as we ask providers to maintain smaller group sizes where possible. Um, Mark and I have been discussing where that might have an impact on, on licensing, particularly around staffing. Um, that's something we're still exploring. If this is a, renew a renewal year and struggling to get some of the items done to renew, how will this affect programs? Uh, that's a great question. We are struggling with that ourselves. We are trying to do as much digital work as possible. Um, we're working with the feds, we're working with MDE, we're working with the consultants. Um, we are hoping to basically do administrative checking um, digitally as much as possible. Um, and then we're going to, we are required to come annually to a facility. And so the goal will be, we will get to you um, throughout the year when uh, we are able to get out into the field. It just will be much later. And we're gonna have to be extending um, some of the requirements because nobody can get out to, to have some of the inspections done, whatever. So we have already done FAQ on some of this, um, but we're trying to work um, basically to help all of us get through this without um, violation as much as possible. If we're working together, uh, we'll do our very best to make sure that um, the violation piece of this would be minimal. If we reopened, but the number of children changes every week, when should we apply for May for the grant so we can get the correct number of children that are attending? We just reopened this week, so our numbers are constantly changing. Uh, I'll jump in on that one. This is Lisa. Um, like I said, uh, April applications are, are still coming in. Providers still have some questions. So we're internally having conversations about when to close that April application and open up the May application. Our intent is that when we open up the May application, um, you're able to, to really look back at a comprehensive piece of time uh, to be able to report the number of children for the month. 
the requirement for the grant is that the child be in attendance for one day during the month. So the timing of releasing that application and giving you all the ability to uh, be able to say the child was there one day uh, is something we're really trying to work hard to make sure can happen. Perfect. Um, this might be an issue that quite a few people might be facing based on the guidance, um, but they asked, if we open and need to make those changes, if we aren't following the guidance, for example, we open May 18th and have 15 now, how do I tell parents that they can no longer come? Yeah, that is exactly one of the challenges that, that we're weighing. Um, again, on the best of days, access to quality affordable care is a challenge in a lot of communities. We certainly recognize that. And so if we get in a position where the group size requirements will require an adjustment in the people who are currently in your care, um, we're striving to offer some technical assistance around that. To be clear, I'm, I'm not indicating at this point whether or not that will change. Um, that's still a decision that we're finalizing internally. But in the event that that has an impact on your, on your business or on the families that you serve, we're gonna work to be active communication partners with you to give you some tools to respond. The next question is, some providers at licensees are concerned about their liability if a child or staff member contracts COVID-19. Do we know if there will be liability protection in place for child care homes and centers providing this essential service? Yeah, this is a question that we've been getting more frequently. Um, right now, there is not a liability. Um, there has not been an executive order addressing liability for child care providers. It, it's a conversation we've been having on an ongoing basis about how we treat all employers. And we've certainly been advocating for consistency among um, child care providers and other, other employers who are also reopening right now. Um, can you also touch on outside of the typical child care centers? Um, someone made a good point that churches also fall under this with nursery programs, Sunday school, Sunday school Bible school. Um, what are your recommendations for that? Um, you, I'll, you I'll just go, say, Mark? I'm just going to say that we don't license any of those, but I would suggest, um, I was just on a Zoom call last night with my church, and we're looking at reopening and what that look, might look like. I, I would recommend that they um, take a look at our document that we put together um, and look at the CDC, DHHS, those kinds of um, documents that are available. And at times they do address certain things, um, I think, like a church reopening, but um, I, I would suggest that they take a look at our document when it's available. And um, we're really recommending very similar things to a, a, a nursery in a church, et cetera. So I think they could use that as a, as a, as a guide for themselves as well. Yeah, I, I would add, I think childcare is a particularly challenging space to provide safe care. And we know that it's essential because families are returning to work and their children need safe spaces to go for families to be able to re-enter the economy. I think where it is possible to maintain a less is best type mentality and limit children's exposure at this time, um, I, do, I do think that's something to consider. I couldn't agree more with Mark that the guidelines are definitely applicable for a, a variety of caregiving environments. And we ultimately wanna to return to a place where our state has really high quality experiences for each and every child. Um, I do think that we are still in a position where, where the virus is requiring that we limit some of those opportunities. Um, and I think looking for guidance from the governor's stay home, stay safe executive orders for when broader convening um, would be appropriate is also a good guideline to watch. Perfect, that's, that's good to know. Um, the next question is that those that have applied for the Child Care Relief Fund grant uh, be paid to providers so we can start getting supplies needed to open up. So I guess, will they be paid to the providers? Yes, uh, the providers are the ones who apply for the grant opportunity and then the payment is issued to the provider directly. And just to make a pitch, that application, we are required to have an application. It is so easy. Um, 
all of our providers so far have said this takes less than 10 minutes. It's easy to apply. Um, so don't let the application stay in your way. Um, visit that website that Lisa mentioned and, and submit. We want to hear from you. Do the new guidelines address social emotional issues with younger children who need to be physically close to their providers? I think the document has some information in there. It probably could be expanded, um, but I think we tried to put some uh, pretty basic information in there. I believe we have a reference for our website as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, what's the, the clarification that people have been making? Like we need to be physically distant where we can, but socially connected. Um, right? Young children need to be held. There is certainly no expectation in the guidelines that you maintain six feet distance from small children in your care. That's not possible. Um, it, it's not good practice developmentally, and it's just not possible. Um, and so, yes, Mark's 100% right. We definitely mentions of social emotional. We're also working with partners across the state to aggregate better technical assistance for providers. We know that you are well versed in how to support social emotional health. This situation is unique. Um, and so being able to give you tools that either brush up skills that you have or new tools to respond to this time, um, we're really committed to that and working with partners like Great Start Collaboratives and others to be able to push that content out to you in, in you know, bite-sized chunks, but also webinars like this that you can join to say, how, how can I most effectively serve the children and families in my care? Uh, the next question is, will the guidance document also address home child care facilities, family and group licenses, or will it focus on centers primarily? As you know, what is practical for a center may not translate the same for an in-home setting. Will home providers get guidance also? I would say that the document is definitely centered more for centers, um, but we did take into account, we have lots of home group home. Um, we are talking about uh, looking at a follow-up or an addendum to this one that would be targeted more for home and group home as those questions come up, but I think they can use it. Um, they'll be able to get a, a lot of good information. Um, we probably will need to be more sensitive to the home group home um, with something like that. So that's, that's kind of step two for us. Perfect. Um, will school age summer care be required to have different PPE guidelines than our birth to five care centers? Think face mask coverings for our employees, et cetera. Yeah. So all, all employers in the state of Michigan, regardless of what kind of business you run, are required right now to provide masks to their staff. All, every staff member on your team, you have to provide as an employer a mask to them. The guidelines right now do not require that they have to wear them. You have to permit those employees to wear them um, if they choose, and you may as an employer implement a, a policy that requires them to be worn. Um, but we know that wearing masks 24 hours a day or even for a full work day can be really challenging. Um, and so the guidance, we, we've been issuing guidance on things like masks um, at a site that Mark, Lisa, and I are maintaining together. It's at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. There's a resources section and a page just for childcare. So we try to provide more in-depth feedback to you about how to operationalize requirements like that. Um, you know, on a soccer field or with infants. Um, and we know that varies, particularly for children. Um, children under two should never wear a mask. Children who can't remove their own mask should never wear a mask. Um, but we certainly recognize how hard it is for young, even, even you know, early elementary children to wear a mask. Um, so it's still in your purview as a, as a business owner, I, I know many of you are also nonprofits, but as an employer, um, that is still in your purview to decide and set a policy. And how do you recommend people deciding on an actual date to reopen? And when they do reopen, are they able to open for all families or only to those essential employees? Yeah, that's certainly a challenging decision. 
um, right now as the executive orders continue to come. So the governor has been regularly updating her stay at home order to clarify which industries are eligible to return. Um, so you, for example, you might have seen in the press, she talked about construction or manufacturing. Um, you are eligible as a child care provider to serve people who need four four categories of work. And I, and I recognize this is a little confusing. We have this on our website as well, that michigan.gov slash coronavirus, if you wanna look at it in more detail. You can serve essential workers, critical infrastructure workers, and staff who perform minimum business functions. I ran through those really fast because in the childcare space, we've really been classifying those as essential workers. So anybody who you've been deeming an essential worker, a critical infrastructure worker, we sort of been using those terms interchangeably in childcare, you can continue to serve those individuals. The new category of families that you can serve are those who are participating in resumed activities. That means that if their parent or caregiver is eligible to return to work um, under the executive order, then you are eligible to care for them. Um, it's a whole laundry list of industries who are eligible to return, and we know that monitoring that for, is challenging. So your obligation as a provider is you have to ask parents um, and caregivers, are you eligible to return to work under the governor's executive order? If they say yes, you don't have to verify that answer. That's not your obligation. That's that individual's obligation, um, and, you can serve, and you can serve those children. Um, in a family that has two caregivers, only one of their parents um, or caregivers has to meet that definition. So if you have a two-parent household, it's really only one that has to qualify under one of those requirements. Um, Mark, Lisa, and I have been talking a lot about how to make that easier for you. We know as more industries reopen, the ability of you to, to monitor that or keep ahead of who's eligible and who's not is challenging. Um, and we're continuing to talk about how to make that easier for you. Um, but in the meantime, that coronavirus site is definitely a place to go so you have a better sense of which industries are eligible and which families might be. Perfect. Um, someone had a question about the electrostatic machines. Are they recommended and are they sufficient as the final step for disinfecting? Mark, anything from you on that? Well We've had some company coming from um, another state that's uh, recommended something like that. We're really going to rely on the local health department to say, you know, is this something that's a good tool? Um, we're not experts in that arena. We're, we have um, minimal um, capability to do anything with it, but um, we're really relying on the local health department to come up and say, this is a tool that really does do whatever they're claiming it's going to do. Um, it, if it, it sounds like they could be quite useful, but I really would double check with uh, your local health department folks who are what we're relying on anyway when you want to come back open, let's say if you get hit with COVID or somebody has had COVID. So we're re really relying on their expertise. Uh, the next question is, when looking at group sizes, will licensed spaces be taken into consideration? If a center is in a school building, there may be only a few rooms that are currently licensed, but may have more space opportunities available. Would any consideration be given into temporarily allowing use of those spaces? Um, I would say as licensing, um, I would want you to work with my consultant and try probably to look at having an option like that and what is it going to take to get that other room opened um, and approved. Um, again, we're locked down and so we're not able to go see things exactly like we have before, but I would be willing to say to you as, as licensing director, we will work with providers if that's an issue um, and if we could somehow help in that process. Um, we want to be respectful of health and safety. Um, but also respectful of we got to we got to help get this business back up and running. Um, so just know we'll be glad to work with you. Just work with a consultant, and they'll end up getting. Um, I'll be part of that discussion. The application for the grant states we have to begin the parent tuition discount immediately. This can pose or this can pose a financial hardship for providers when the checks aren't arriving quickly. 
Will there be, will, oh my gosh, sorry. Will there be a penalty if a program waits to offer discounts until after funds are paid to the provider? So that's a common question uh, that we've been uh, receiving. Uh, the intention for uh, including that provision really goes back to the, the goals that Michelle talked about early in terms of accessibility and affordability for families and trying to balance that as well as balancing the provider needs. So we're asking you to commit to doing that forward, uh, knowing that we're also doing our best to process those grant applications. Uh, I, I had to repurpose the staff in my office to the processing of those applications. Um, so we are trying to do our best. We just ask that providers do their best as well and try and make the best decisions possible to support their small business. Uh, like Michelle said, we know you're all a little bit different. You're unique. Um, you have different circumstances. Uh, so we're trying to be flexible uh, as we can as we implement this um, and balance our goals and everybody's needs. And I don't know if Michelle wants to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I just want to add, I mean, Lisa said we've gotten that question a few times and we certainly recognized that we would need to make changes to the grant as we implemented. We would learn some things from all of you. Um, and that's something that we're evaluating when we look at the provisions for the May grant application round. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're getting a few questions here about the eligibility for parents. Um, does it have to be both parents or is it just one? And then what if uh, the parents are divorced in separate homes with joint custody? Would that still qualify as one parent being considered essential? You cut out just a little bit, Molly, but I think you're asking, you know, for a little more detail on when children can access formal child care right now. Um, you know, I think this is not a space where we have really stringent rules. Um, and so I think that your judgment as, an, as a child care provider feels reasonable. Our philosophy has been um, if one of those parents is eligible to return to work, then that child is eligible to return to care. And under the philosophy that we're trying to maintain consistent care environments for children, it feels reasonable that they would continue, um, that they would continue in that care environment, regardless of which parent has custody. You know, I, I think one of the themes that you're probably hearing from this conversation is our, our sincere attempt to, to really maintain safe spaces while being as flexible as we can, which I know is kind of a strange place for a highly regulated industry to be standing in. Um, but we want you to know that we are working to be as clear about those bright red lines as we can. Um, and then saying for everything else, how can we work together to achieve the goal, which is you know, safe spaces for children. Um, and if you're working with us on that, we wanna work with you too. And once the stay at home order is lifted, will transporting kids be allowed? Um, in the guidelines, we do talk about transportation some. And so we have had discussions on some of the be best practices there um, when it's um, able to be done. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, I, I not want to go into much more than that. I think, um, yeah, I think that would be where I would stop. Okay. Um, and then is there information about how the total number of kids in a program versus the daily number of kids affects exposure? Fewer is better, but how much increased risk comes with having additional kids who come because of part-time care? Yeah, you know, I think that's exactly what we have been trying to understand. And what we've heard from our medical partners is, again, I know you said you already said it, but less is best. And so your ability as a provider to maintain consistent groups of children, um, that should be your first goal. And if you're serving part children who are in part-time care, that may look different for you. Than, um, than a different environment. I think looking for those opportunities and always checking the policy that you're implementing to say, 
is this the least amount of exposure that I can allow um, in this environment? Given all of the constraints that exist in your facility, with your staffing, with the families that you serve, right now that's what you're trying to achieve. Less, fewer children, fewer spaces, fewer providers, um, recognizing again that some things are out of your control. Um, that's what we would ask you to consider at this point. And, and as we learn more about that, we have partnerships with the folks that, that Mark mentioned that we're asking regularly that what does the science tell us? Can we give better guidance? I know our goal going in was to say, here's the number. Um, and what we've been told is that that's complicated. Um, and we're trying to learn more about how to give the best guidance to you. Perfect. And based on time, this will be the last question uh, that we take, but are there any lists or documentations we can view and which will help providers who need to renew know which items we do not need to stress about, but still send in the renewal application in time, such as TB testing for children who turn 14, medical releases, or furnace inspections? Um, I'll be glad to answer that. On our frequently asked questions, we do talk about um, some of those renewals and how we're handling those. Just know our intent is we're, we're postponing them um, until life gets back to where you can go get them. Um, and we understand, we don't know when that is right now. So we are extending those. Um, just know that I work with my field staff trying to make it uh, the best possible for you as providers knowing you're living in this very complicated world and you just can't go run out and, and get um, a new certification, um, a new, even a doctor's appointment at times. So um, watch our frequently asked questions and we tend to update that in a number of those, even the furnace, those are out there on that FAQ. Perfect. Well, again, I do want to be respectful of all of your time. Um, I know there was a few questions that we were not able to get to. So if, if you were one of the people that we weren't able to get to your question, please feel free to send um, myself or anyone on the Travers Connect team an email. Our emails can be found on the Travers Connect website. My name again is Molly McGurr, and we will be sure to get um, any questions that you have over to Mark, Michelle, and Lisa. But on that note, Mark, Michelle, and Lisa, we cannot thank you enough for your time today and all of your expertise. I know it was extremely, extremely beneficial to those listening today. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. I hope everyone has um, a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.